This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. Wherever you are from. Um, if we can all please go on mute if you're not speaking, that will be hugely helpful. Um, so we're going to give another minute and kick off with some of our icebreaker activities before we start for people to join in. Uh, but in the meantime, it's good day, Shweta. Thank you very much. Nice to see you here. If you're coming again, welcome again. If you're joining the first time, um, super excited to have you on the session today. Um, do reach out to us later with your questions and um, also check out Aspire for Her community for the new people who don't know that. So um, we've launched this just under three weeks ago. It's going to be three weeks exactly tomorrow. And the team is very excited about it. Some of us just feel that we've been working together for so long. We started with money conversations, how to talk about money with your friends and your family and your colleagues and be comfortable with it as women. Um, with our partners from Womanista and Paid Forward. And we have, of course, our partner from Womanista, Neha Singh, again today. Then we followed with psychology of money, what all little things we all need to sort of change in our minds uh, to, again, get comfortable with the idea of having our names on our on our properties or bank accounts or checkbooks or um, many other things that we tend to think, oh, it's somebody else's job, etc. And today we are gathering again for an extremely interesting topic, which is financial security. We all know the term, but we don't know what it means. And it, the good thing is it means different for everybody. Um, so we'll dive into it very soon. But before that, our usual check, uh, we're going to keep letting people in. Um, and I'll hand over to um, Steffi for some of our icebreaker questions. And if the Aspire for Her founder, Madhuradas Gupta, joins the call, we'll um, also give, a, give her a minute or two to share um, sort of her reflections, what she's been sort of looking on from the sidelines and also as uh, my co-pilot, my guide on this initiative. And, uh, and then we'll let um, Anu, um, sorry, sorry, my apologies, Neha do her magic. Over to you, um, Steffi. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so let's get started. We have a few questions, as ma'am mentioned, uh, before we kickstart the session, uh, which will really help break the ice. We'll keep it interactive. So please send in your answers to the chat box. Um, here's my first question. What do the words financial security mean to you? I'm also putting the question in the chat box. I repeat, what do the words financial security mean to you? Being independent financially, yes. Okay, you guys waiting for your answers. Feeling confident that you can manage finances yourself. Assets bring passive income. Relief, okay. Not having to worry about money. Yes, we all want to having money for retirement. Support during difficult times. Absolutely. Having access to money when you need it. Correct. Securing the future. Having extra for a rainy day. Oh, well, accurate. To be able to sustain even without working during tough times. Correct. Also after retirement. Right, I'm so glad to see these answers. I think we're all on the same page here. Um, yeah, so having said that, we move on to our next question, um, which is, you know, what is what are the financial lessons that you would hope to pass on to your kids? I repeat, what are the financial lessons that you hope you can pass on to your kids? Start savings from the first pocket money, right? Know how to make money as an enabler, not a fear. Save the power of compounding. Know how to make money, save, yes. The power of compounding, absolutely. Start early savings, yes. Very, very, very important. Uh, multiple sources of income. The chats are going back very fast. Uh, and always own her money, correct? Setting financial goals, make money, um, 
revise in the expenditure save it for your screen. wonderful beautiful responses how to keep a balance between savings and spendings to be wise in their expenditure yes i think most of them are related to savings and you know uh, the value of money which is great um these are things that we should learn from the very beginning okay so i think i see uh, madhra ma'am on call right now i would like to request her to uh, say a few things and over to you ma'am thank you so much steffi this is such a special moment and uh, you know uh, it's it's actually amazing simran just mentioned and uh, that this is barely 3 weeks into the launch of uh, she knows money and uh, super proud and uh, super super impressed with uh, you know what we've managed to achieve within that few weeks and i must tell you how all the people got together here okay i mean i'm not seeing a lot of people on on with their videos on and love to see more people with their videos on but um you know simran actually joined us as a mentor uh, she is all the way in in cold sweden and uh, you know it is so amazing that she decided she's not from a financial background but she decided that she wanted to pick up financial literacy as what she wanted to do at aspire for her so super proud of the way in which we've sort of put this all together uh, and uh, you know with uh, of course without simran's leadership i think we would not be standing here today because uh, we all got together we thought of lots of things and because i am from a financial background i must tell you that there were more things holding me back Uh, than going forward and it was simran's uh, uh, you know i would say interest and persistence and her encouragement that actually made us jump into financial literacy and say let's get started so so happy simran thank you for doing that and thank you for uh, you know getting us all together on this platform um, you know vidya of course is part of aspire for her she leads our operations and technology and vidya is uh, you know also a very very passionate advocate of financial literacy uh, in young kids so you know they've all come together with a purpose steffi wrote to me a few months ago and uh, steffi in fact i i i didn't know steffi at all uh, from from uh, you know where she came from but she wrote to me with such passion that she wanted to do something around making women financially independent and making women literate about their financial choices you know i could not uh ignore her message i could not ignore her mail not that we ignore any mails but it was so compelling that i thought that it's very important to get steffi into this team also and neha neha is one of our first entrepreneurs to join aspire for her uh and you know we worked together uh, when you and women came in and said hey you know can you give us some exciting folks who work with women and money and i thought of neha and neha was is also proudly featuring in the un women website uh, you must see that if you if you haven't already seen that uh, so neha and womanista have also been a very very interesting part of our growing up aspire for her's growing up really and this is how these four very different people from different parts of the world have got together and created she knows money and uh, there are many other people that she knows money as well Uh, and we I, i we will talk about them i'm sure simran has lots of plans about introducing all of them to you and some of them have already come on our platform uh, but it's been such an amazing journey to do this with all of you and uh, this is such an important topic for aspire for her as we try to add 1 million women to the workforce by 2025 10 million by 2030 if you do not understand money if you are not financially literate you've not even taken the first step towards financial independence and we know many women who are actually earning very handsomely but then they hand over their entire earning to a male member of the family and do not do anything uh, that they could have done potentially to uh, to to do something with the to to create something of value uh, with their money and that is our humble endeavor uh, to to get all of you to talk about these things to uh, to reduce the friction and the unease that we have uh, about talking about money uh, we even have a very uncomfortable relationship with money complicated relationship with money uh, we want to just take that away and make it a beautiful seamless journey where we have a happy relationship with money we earn it we spend it we grow with it So uh, thank you so much Simran once again for doing this and for getting everyone together. I'm really looking forward to the session Neha.
Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you so much, Madhura. And thank you for opening up the whole Aspire for our community for it. I was just thinking about the vertical and Madhura said, nope, it has to be for the entire community, cross communities, cross everything. We, of course, have lots of plans coming ahead. Um, some of them will keep them secret because we're still working on them. But let's dive in today. I think um, we can kick off our poll, uh, Vidya or Priya, very quickly before we then hand over to Neha. Yes, launching the poll. I think between the first two options, uh, there's a, a race as to who will be on top. I think currently the second option is leading. Okay, I'll leave it on for five more seconds, guys. Okay, ending the poll. If I can take one more minute, uh, Simran, um, you know, I can see Parna is here and uh, I'd really like to take a second to congratulate Parna. I must tell you Parna's story. Parna joined us our, in our She Days community and she literally put in blood and sweat behind, uh, you know, ensuring that she gets certified uh, uh, by AWS. And uh, yesterday, Parna, was it yesterday? She has joined AWS full time. Wow. I oh, congratulate everyone to celebrate with us and Parna. Parna Thank you so much, ma'am. Well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a little messy to come on camera. <laughs> but I think huge congratulations. And once you're settled at AWS, which is a great company, I, I'm at IBM and AWS is a big partner for us. Um, let's talk about the earnings you're making and how you're investing them. <laughs> and we would like to show people your story. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> all I hope to grow it, uh, it with all your advice. <laughs> yes, not we're gonna, missing we're a gonna beat, be not missing a the... beat. Okay. Yes. <laughs> no, we're gonna we're gonna make a pie chart for everybody very soon, uh, where you can see your portfolios. All righty, over to you, Neha. Thank you. Hi, hi, everyone. And it's been such a wonderful start to the session. I am feeling the pressure and, and all of those who've been attending my sessions earlier, it's rare for me to feel the pressure with Madhura in the room. I think the pressure is on me now. <laughs> but it's one of the topics which, you know, I, I think um, it's a topic which we talk very less about, but it concerns all of us in the secret uh, you know, areas when you're sitting with ourselves in our bedroom, sometimes anxious, sometimes stressed about money. Uh, but rarely, unfortunately, do we talk about um, this stress or anxiety with anybody around us. So it's a wonderful and very important topic around financial security. So I know you all have already done a poll, but I wanted to start the session by asking you one question. Um, in fact, I will ask the question before I jump into what Womanista is about. I will come back to this. But before we get into uh, what Humanista is about, I want to ask all of you, is financial security, is it a feeling? Okay. Or is this something which is linked? Is it logical? Is it tangible? Is it linked to my state of finances? What do you guys think? Tell me in the chat box. What is it? Is it a feeling or is it a state of finances? It's a reality. Mm -hmm. So just connect that that word, what it you know brings to you. Fear is a feeling, but with right mindset, it is the state of finances. Interesting. Both. Let's go. Is financial security a feeling or is it a state of finances? Dependent on each other. Let's get a few more options. The latter. It's a state of finances. Okay. 
It's very interesting, right? State of finances. We can feel secure and see the state of finances and be assured. Beautiful. So I love how Parna has put it. And in fact, I picked this up uh, from somewhere on the net when I was trying to figure out, you know, what is it actually? So it very well is a feeling to the, of, it, it refers to that peace of mind that you feel like um, Madhura rightly right. said, that feeling of being stress-free when you aren't worried about money, right? It is a feeling which comes from a reality and that reality can be broken down into four parts. We've broken it down into four parts, okay? If you have an emergency fund, if you have taken care of your bigger risks, if you are debt free, and if you have assets of your own, these are actually four very tangible parts of that sense of security or that feeling that you get that I am financially secure. So today's session, um, I'm going to run with you around the emergency fund, around insurance. We will also talk a little bit about savings because it's a part we cannot ignore. But before that, a quick little introduction of Womanista and myself today. One second, sorry about that. Yes. Um, Womanista is a platform which was launched in 2020 and uh, with a single vision and dream that we're going to bring more and more women to talk and um, get enabled with tools, with knowledge, which will help them own their financial decisions. Over the last two years, we've partnered with platforms um, like AFH and many others. We've also been running multiple personal finance workshops. We've launched a one-on-one -on -one consultation service exclusively for women. And the best part is that over these, uh, you know, 7,000 plus women that, you know, we've interacted with, most of them came from a non-finance background and they turned into first-time investors. So they moved, the shift happened from being savers to investors just by that little push and nudge of learning and community. And that's exactly the endeavor that I have with this huge community that we can start having those conversations and build on that learning so that we can take it forward, right? So let's jump into learning about an emergency fund today. Do you all know what is an emergency fund? Would you all know what is an emergency fund? If there's even one person in the room who says, no, I don't know, it's, I'm going to take it up on me to say, hey, listen, let me tell you what it is. What is an emergency fund? Everyone knows? Okay. For the ones who are not talking to me today, please talk to me. Um, Quickly, very quickly, emergency fund is a, crisis, is a crisis fund, a small crisis fund. Ready cash, which needs to be available. Let's call it liquid cash. Let's not call it ready, uh, like, as in it's not just sitting in your savings account, but it's available to you quickly. And there's no penalty if you were to get that money, right? Um, is it mandatory? Yes, it's mandatory. I think post-COVID, most of us have recognized uh, that there will be a crisis which we cannot even be prepared with, right? So the first question which most of us might have is how much is an emergency fund? How much would be an emergency fund? So I've read multiple posts online, et cetera, and I'm sharing what I have used personally in my system. And simply because it works for me, and I'm hoping it will work for you, instead of starting from income, the starting point for an emergency fund ideally should be your expenses. And here is my logic. Right. If there is a job loss, which is a big emergency, if you are the bread earner, um, in that case, you still have to pay the bills. Right. So the first cause of stress is I lost my job and I don't know how will I pay the bills. So the first thing that you secure is to make sure that your monthly expenses, which you were paying, already are taken care of. And for how much time? For a period of six months. Okay, so minimum of six X or six months, six times. So if my monthly expenses are say 20,000, I will do six into 20,000, one lakh 20,000 is an adequate emergency fund. Sometimes I also feel that a lot of women end, to end up 
over preparing for emergencies do you think you're in that category where you know sometimes you're like no no i have way more than six times of my monthly expenses if there are any uh, anyone in the room who would say yeah i end up doing that because i'm always feeling like you know emergency can show up that's very very natural but it is absolutely essential to realize that an emergency fund will only be able to earn very less money okay it's not your wealth creating fund so as women one of the first lessons that we were taught was to save 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 and i feel like a lot of women just end up keeping all that money as the rainy day fund okay if you are someone who's on the other side you have too much money kept as emergency fund please prune it bring it down 6x is good enough if you are someone who is in a special situation like for example maybe um you don't have a backup like you're the only person in the family a single parent etc so maybe you're someone who is a freelancer doesn't have an a short source of income maybe you're starting out new with your business you're not sure of your your sources of income are not very stable right now or um also maybe there are there's a lot of family members who are dependent on you right like maybe your parents are dependent on you etc you might want to consider taking this from 8 to 12 times but beyond that it'll be it's better to invest rather than keep everything in an emergency fund right so once you've done this the next logical question is where should i park this emergency fund okay so like i said ready cash i said this money needs to be quickly available but with no penalties so i propose the 50 30 20 rule here where you can look at parking your emergency fund 50% of that can go into something known as a liquid mutual fund now liquid mutual funds are a category of mutual funds which are safer so it doesn't have guaranteed returns but historically they are proven that the ups and downs of these funds are very very limited which means that the volatility or the risk associated with this fund would be very very low and they also give you around 1 to 1.5% extra return over and above an fd right so typically what you are trying to do is you are trying to build an optimum mix of your emergency fund you keep some money in savings 20% of this money in savings account you keep 30% of the money in a bank recurring or fixed deposit now you could keep this in a one year deposit or a two year deposit not a very very long term deposit and the remaining you could park in a liquid or an ultra short duration mutual fund the entire idea of doing this see you could have just kept this money in cash and that's also all right but why this division the only idea is that at least this happened with me that at one point when my expenses were fairly high and i did six multiplied by that number and i said oh this this is a good chunk of money which is just going to be sitting in my bank account earning nothing and it made me feel super guilty that why would i just keep this money uh, at lower than inflation right so that's the logic why i said no let's let's split it up in a manner where the penalties are, are negligible uh, negligible at the same time my returns on my emergency fund are at least equal to inflation so it doesn't pinch me that you know this money is kept somewhere a large chunk and i'm not earning anything on it right any questions on this any doubts around this happy to take where is we this liquid question we have a question there in the chat the from somia kumari i can read it but somia if you would like to unmute and ask the question yourself we would encourage you to do that please hi neha i'm really cu hi. curious to know like where is this liquid mutual fund saved because i have no clue about that okay so this is actually a type of a fund which you can go and buy whenever you are investing in any sort of funds i'm sure we'll be doing session on mutual funds so think of it like one type of a mutual fund which you can go and buy what do they invest in at the back so imagine think of it like a basket okay of things that they are investing in they are investing in some sort of bonds okay government bonds at the back but that's not something you have to kind of you're not managing managing it an expert is managing it and you can go and buy this from any mutual fund website so that that's a particular type of mutual fund does that help all right thank you 
does it matter which company's mutual fund we put our money in um in case of liquid mutual funds um i would say the difference between fund a versus fund b would be fairly minimal right i don't think it's a very uh, because there is a, just a certain range of returns in which they'll all play right so i wouldn't say it would matter that much in case of liquid funds but if you were doing other mutual funds and when we get to mutual funds as a session then yes then it does matter which which not let's say company but which uh, scheme you are investing in we have a question and we have a hand raised so let's quickly take the question um sri lata um would you like to unmute yourself janan let's take the question what is the typical period good for liquid mutual funds so in case of an emergency fund so if i was to park for an emergency fund i would just leave it there till there is a need a to use that money okay or two if there was uh, a change in my family situation and i needed to pump it up i would then add to it so in case of a liquid mutual fund there you don't have to put a timeline it's like an investment that you've done and that can continue um, for as long as you don't need that money so here we're talking about building an emergency fund which can just be parked there and kept there it can just be left there fantastic it's great that we have lots of questions pouring in and we'll try and answer them as many as possible um or else we're going to work through a yeah, q and a yeah. process for later stages <laughs> but parna has so her I, hand i did not realize up. that i opened up and i know um so parna has her hand up i'll we we'll let her ask the question and continue and for the rest we'll yeah. take a pause in a couple of minutes and you know uh, respond to those other questions as well parna yeah hi thank you so much so uh, so i i had asked the question about uh, do, does it matter which company we put our money in so uh, i i see a lot of people doing a lot of research uh, of that company where they are actually putting the money into mm. so do we really need to go into that much depth that understanding mm. where that uh, company is actually putting the money into and whether it will benefit me how much research is good enough before deciding so parna like i said for liquid fund specifically the category the type i'm telling you ha huh. um the range is not very wide right there okay uh, you know it's not required but as soon as you move into different types and categories there are many many types and categories of funds as soon as you start moving into higher risk uh categories there definitely you need to do research and uh, learn more and um, then take a decision all right okay thank you so much all right okay, let's continue let's so this was a small risk right so i call it the small risk small crisis fund but what happens to the big risks that can come without an announced right for that you have a product called insurance okay now insurance just like taxes always gets this heavy sigh in the room ki oh god this is going to be a heavy and boring topic but i'm going to try to make it as interesting and um, crisp as i can in the time that we have so we are going to talk about two major types of insurances which all of us must know about life and health insurance okay i'm going to define these so please listen to me carefully what is life insurance and what is health insurance life insurance is a protection in case the bread earner or the person who was getting the money passes away so it's a protection for the dependents or the people who are depending on that person's income in case that person passes away okay that definition has to be very very crystal clear so now i have a question do you think homemakers require life insurance you have that definition i just told you do you think homemakers require life insurance i have iphone 13 saying yes 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 definitely yes let's go one of any one of you who's saying yes please unmute and please tell all of us why you think a homemaker requires life insurance whoever feels a little confident okay so don't take it in the wrong way go for it 
Hi, my name is Gargi. Hi, I Gargi. hope I'm not uh, interrupting anyone. I just wanted to say, although I'm a uh, you know single person earner, but what if a wife who's completely dependent on the husband or a mother who's completely dependent on the son for her livelihood and mm. uh, suddenly something happens to the husband or the son and mm. he mm. passes away, then mm. what to do? Mm. Where does the money come? So definitely life insurance for that homemaker is necessary. I think from oh, my so end, this she is what need my to take a policy is. for Thank herself. You, so her husband has to take or her son has to take. So I'll, I'll take, take right life insurance. Yeah. I will take, for example, if huh. my daughter is dependent on me for the income. Right. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Now, so because if something happens to me, then who's going to pay the bills, right? For her. Right. Yeah. Now my question is, so I take the life insurance. I take. Okay. Okay. Right. Huh. Now my question is, I put it in perspective again. Hmm. Um, does a homemaker need to take a life insurance in her name for herself? If there is somebody dependent on that homemaker. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's it's required then. Okay. I feel so from my understanding. Superb. Yeah. That's exactly now for everybody. So I'll I'll pick that point Thank and you. I'll just say this. Thanks, Gary. Thanks so much. So it's often misconstrued that a homemaker doesn't have economic value, right? Nobody is dependent on her because she's not bringing in the money. But if there are any homemakers in this room. I think you've got to agree that there is a huge economic value to all the work that you do in the family. If you were to be replaced, <laughs> there would be a financial implication on the family, right? Yes, no, maybe. Any homemakers in the room who feel like, yeah, right, did not think of it like that. So if you are not there, maybe the family needs more support for the kids. Maybe the family needs I don't know, a tutor, a driver. I don't know. So a nanny. That a mom is doing today, me included, right? So that's the reason why now a lot of insurance uh, companies have also started giving homemakers life insurance, which can be attached with the spouse's insurance. So that was point number one. Okay, now with that definition, that was for life. Let me quickly tell you the definition for health insurance. Health, I think we all know. In case there's a medical emergency, I need to get admitted. There's a huge expense. I need support from the insurance company who's going to come and pay the bill because I have been paying the premiums, right? That's pretty much the definition. For that big emergency, I don't have as much money. Who's going to pay? The health insurance company. Now with these two definitions, can you tell me, is life insurance a must-have for everybody or is it my choice? Like, this is my situation. Yeah, I, I'll talk about that. I will give a minimum or how much amount. But first you all tell me, life insurance must have for everybody or is it my choice? Yes, no, maybe, quickly. Yes, everybody should have life insurance. Okay, let's go. Yes, everyone needs life insurance. Yes, it's a must for everyone. Okay, I like that. A few things on my name have no kids, so not required for everyone. I love it. So absolutely, it's not required for everyone. Unlike what your LIC uncle told you that you need it. Um, no, if you're 25, 26, nobody's dependent on you. Um, you have no kids. Your parents are perfectly independent financially. No, you don't need to buy yourself a life insurance. Please do not waste your money by buying yourself life insurance. Okay, so it is mandatory only for those who have dependents. Dependents could be children, could be your parents, or if you have huge loans, right? I've also added this expected to have dependents because sometimes when you get married and you're thinking of having a family, et cetera, et cetera, maybe that's the time when you should have this conversation about getting yourself life insurance. Health insurance on the other hand is mandatory for everybody, okay? We all need to have health insurance. How much? Quick rule of thumb right here for so please remember that a perfect calculation can only be done by a financial expert if you speak to them individually but as a rule of thumb if you were to just go and check 10 times of your annual income so in case of your family 
say your husband wife with kids um you want to check whether you are adequately insured take your family's annual income so if your family's annual income is 20 lakh rupees you multiply it by 10 which means your adequate cover or protection should be 2 crores that's the adequate amount of life insurance protection you need health insurance i have put a figure of at least 10 lakhs but really if you ask me another way to look at it is dependent on the city that you live in your preferred choice of hospital you can go and check what would be the cost of a you know heart disease um the treatment of a heart disease and that could be an approximate amount for health insurance one very important thing which i want to park here do not if if especially if you are say in your mid 20s and your parents are now becoming senior citizens or they are already senior citizens and you all have this one family policy i would highly recommend that let that cover be kept for them and get out of that policy if you are healthy and fit get yourself an individual policy simply because it becomes expensive for them to buy another policy okay a second the the cover might not be enough for all of you together second uh, third and the third very important thing is that you need to now start building your individual um you know benefits for your health insurance at a young age when you're healthy right so keeping this in mind i've put at least 10 lakhs but it really does depend on your health history for all those who have been employed and your company gives you a health cover please do not just depend on that one cover get yourself a small cover separately for your let's talk a little bit about life insurance because this is one of those topics which you know a lot of us have been uh, very confused about so i'm going to break this down into two parts all all types of life insurance policies are broken into either term plans or non term plans okay these are words that you will read in any document or hear in conversations what is a term plan a term plan is what gives you pure risk it's like a protection okay think of it like an umbrella the main purpose or of this plan is to protect your dependents which means that i am going to pay some money so that people who are left behind get a nice big chunk of money once i'm not there okay its main purpose is to replace this income and many times typically it does not come with anything called as a maturity benefit which means hey i took this policy till the age of 65 and nothing happened i'm very healthy and alive what do i get for all these years that i paid the premium nothing okay so this is where most of us are like ye hum kyu lenge because hame to kuch mila nahi wapas but um trust me in the next slide i'll show you a simple calculation which will explain to you that why it's important to keep these insurance and investment things separate right the other thing is there are also some plans now which are returning you the premium they are higher uh, cost plans personally do not recommend taking any such plan i am a big fan of pure term plans okay uh, don't try to combine the two the other two very common ones that you will see is a savings or endowment plan and a unit linked insurance plan a ulip okay these are called non term they also have some protection okay but not very high protection the savings or endowment plan whenever you hear this word that we have a savings plan okay it's an insurance plan with a feature of some guaranteed returns that's the feature of this plan okay and if you come across this term ulip it's basically another insurance plan which says no there are no guarantees the returns will be linked to the market performance wherever they are investing whatever is the result that you get there so there are no guarantees in this plan okay one quick hack in case anybody finds this difficult to identify you know where do i find these terms so a simple hack which i use personally whenever anybody asks me about a policy is if you just look at the uh, you know if you look at the logo of the product or the brochure whoever is giving you or suggesting that product right under the name you will find some keywords okay so this is a hack for today if you see this policy by tata ai it says non linked non participating life insurance plan okay if you see this lic it's an endowment plan so as soon as you hear the word endowment 
it's non linked means it's not linked to any sort of market performance okay and uh, here you will see it says a unit linked non participating life insurance plan so you can easily try to understand or ident identify which type of plan are, is being sold to you because sometimes people don't tell you exactly which type of plan is being sold to you so you can just look at this yourself and be able to now identify easily whether it's a pure risk cover or a savings plan or a ulip that is being sold okay which is the right option i will open the floor for questions but let me just run through this if i was to choose neha between a term endowment or a ulip which is the right option for me okay so let's take an example every year you are paying a premium of 10000 rupees in case of a term plan and against that 10000 approximately you can get yourself a cover of 1 crore now this is for a 30 32 year old healthy person okay in india right now approximately this would be the cost it could be 10 or 12 something like that right in that range against that look at the size of the cover the protection is nice and big 1 crore unlike the investment plans or the non term plans for a premium of 1 lakh every year you're going to get a cover which is approximately 10 times okay maybe 15 times you can go back and look at your policies you'll be amazed that every year you're paying 1 lakh for those lic plans and when you look at the sum assured or the protection it will be negligible it will be like 10 lakhs 15 lakhs how long is the family going to last with 10 lakh rupees you tell me what is the kind of protection that your family is getting with 10 lakh and this is specially to all the women in the room who have never looked at the insurance papers in their family okay this uh, is super duper important don't neglect this because this is uh, like base zero of financial security right now interestingly i used this 10000 to buy this policy you paid 1 lakh rupees to buy this investment plan okay um i paid 10000 i still had 90000 right compared to your 1 lakh so i just went and invested this 90000 in say a basic mutual fund or some sort of investment which gave me 10% return after 10 years of paying this of of this investment i got 16 lakhs you also kept investing you kept paying the premium of 1 lakh every year diligently after 10 years you will get 13 lakhs or 14 lakhs in either cases right what happened you got a low cover you didn't get make enough money what happened and the best part is by the way you get tax benefit across every type so it's not like you get tax benefit only in this or that no you get a tax benefit across it's just that we are constantly thinking that this plan didn't give me anything back but we forget that the cost what i saved here i could invest it and i could have made more money on it right so if i was to prioritize priority number 1 is to protect yourself at the best price which is a term plan and then in case you are lost you don't know where to invest look at these plans only as investment opportunities based on your risk appetite you don't want to take any risk you're very happy with 5 to 6% kind of a return go for a plan like this your typical lic plans right if you want a little more return you still don't understand anything about mutual funds etc go for this plan but priority number 1 always remains getting a full blown cover with a term policy now i'm going to pause and i'm going to take as many questions as you might have around life insurance because it's hot 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 so we have quite a few questions yes. so let's give ourselves about 5 7 minutes uh we have about 15 minutes we have minutes. time so i'm going to try and start from the top um but there do you want to pick the first question just to ensure some of them might be a little bit repeat and that we've addressed and i'm um just to tell the audience that i'm actually copying these questions and oh. the ones we are unable to answer we'll try to address them through our social channels or in in future uh, future sessions so stay tuned uh, just in case your question isn't answered vidya go ahead do you want to pick one yes uh, sure uh, so there's a question from parna uh, parna do you want to unmute unmute yourself or uh, can i read it out to you uh, yeah either way so uh, 
basically uh, what I'd like to know is in case of uh, the endowment or the ULIP life insurance plan, when do we get the bonus and the returns? Is it after the death? Because if you get the bonus before, then obviously you can utilize that bonus and returns for something in life. So, but <laughs> <laughs> no, no, fair, no, no, fair point. So it depends, really depends on a lot of schemes, uh, on the feature of the schemes. So there are some plans which are called money back. You know, what they'll do is in that 15 year or 20 year long journey, they will promise you little, okay. little, little, little money in the way, on the way, right? And okay. I'm talking typical LIC in my head, right? So, um, but there are some plans that say, okay, hey, you stay with us for these 10 years. And at the end, there will be this bonus for all the years that you stayed with us, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it really depends on the features of that plan. But I would say, Parna, I think you need to step back and think of it this way. Um, um, if you're looking at this as an investment, right? Yeah. I would want to maximize, then I would like to look at the return. What is the return I'm making on this investment, right? And if I was to invest, then I would want to maximize my return. So if I'm making a five and a half, six, six and a half percent return, including that bonus, then the question is whether this is, I mean, could I have done better with my money is the question you should ask right. yourself. Right? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Neha. Yeah. So there's another question from Arun. Uh, so you want to unmute, unmute yourself? Should I read it for you, Arun? Yeah, hi, uh, hi, Nigam. Hi, Arun. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. How are you? Very well. Uh, so uh, I have one small uh, question. So uh, with respect to term plans, there are certain uh, plans which are available, which is like a money back. Let's say they mm -hmm. uh, give you back some partial amount of money at the age of uh, 60 or 70. So is it uh, something good to go with? Because uh, we know that, okay, uh, rather than the uh, typical ULIP or LIC, we should go for term plan. But in term plan, they have now subdivisions where they right. give some money back to us. Uh, should we opt for that or uh, the ones which uh, we don't get returns? That okay. you know, so, so here is what you can do. These are called TROPS, basically term with return of premium. So what they're saying is that at the end of whatever the time period, 60 or 70, all the premiums you've paid me till now, I will return that. Okay. Correct. So um, if I was to do, if let me just tell you on top, like basic math around this, mm -hmm. they will charge you an extra premium because for this feature. So if a regular term plan was say coming at 10,000, they'll say, hey, listen, if you want this maturity feature, pay us 20 or 30% extra, right? Which means your premium has now gone up to 12,000 or 13,000. And at the end of 60 years, if I was to do the time value calculation that what I get back for paying that extra 3000 every year, they don't turn out to be the wisest option. Okay. Having said that, a lot of people just feel this sense of comfort. Ki mera paisa aa hai. Okay. So mm -hmm. if you're not optimizing for return, then I would say it's not a great plan. Still save up on that 3000 invested somewhere. I'll make a better return. It'll be a higher return. If you're someone who feels, no, 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 at least something should come back. See, the time value doesn't justify it as per me. The math doesn't justify it. But feeling wise, if you have that feeling, then make that choice. But know that it is a, uh, it is not the optimum choice is what I can say. Okay. But uh, eventually, like, let's say per year three, three K, let's say uh, if I'm 30 right now. So for another 30 years, uh, so three K per year. So if mm. that calculation, if you do uh, like somewhere around a lakh or rupees, so mm -hmm. if that is the case, then uh, return what we are paying. So like, one so lakh basically at the age of 60 or whatever you will get. You know? mm -hmm. Uska, us time ka value dekho ke, it will be nothing. Instead, if you invest that 3000 today at 10% or 12%, that will become much higher in 30 years uh, against that money that you're going to get, that one lakh you're going to get. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so but the return guarantee, uh, do they usually give that uh, initial principal which we pay? Like let's say, let's say 10k uh, instead of that 13 we are paying for these plans let's mm -hmm. say that uh, 13 uh, they are gonna uh, give us back at the age of 60. yeah typically that's how the plan is structured uh, in that case, by... yeah it's it's like, in that case it's like uh total 13 uh for uh next 30 years whatever the amount is there which we have administered so that we are getting it return right so does it uh lesser than the actual amount like 
if you want i can do a calculator and send you because i would have loved to yeah, do it that would be better yeah please <laughs> we will kind of call actually, that would be better but uh, uh, if, I, I, if i could interject i actually want to bring attention to our female audience thank you arun for joining firstly and asking the question but i also want to bring this attention to our female audience that Arun is not shy asking question after question after question. <laughs> also not shy of asking Neha to do the calculation and give it to him, right? Yeah. Now, right or wrong, I will leave up to each of one of you to judge. But the point here is speak up, ask questions and ask for what you want. So Arun, I think Absolutely. after from this point on, Neha is actually very social on social channels. If she's reachable reach out to her if she's willing to offer her service to you please take it um so if i could request let's um quickly move on to a couple of next questions that have been waiting in the queue sure. so one question i think ripula has it here which uh, actually two of them are very interesting um if i could take them with there if you don't mind ripula, uh, please, please question, go. does it make sense to take term insurance at 55. do you have dependents ripula yeah. Do you have anybody who is dependent on your income at 55? You or your husband? Uh, your not, yeah, my husband, is. The, I mean, I'm a doctor, but I'm not earning as much. I'm just doing a part-time, kind of just taking it easy. Mm -hmm. So they're mainly dependent. We are all dependent on him, my husband. Mm -hmm. He has a term insurance? No, neither of us have a term insurance. It'll be expensive for you to consider this right now, honestly. Yeah. But yeah. Um, one dip check which you can do is, do you have assets worth 10x of your income? If you all have assets which are yes. worth 10x of your income or more, yes, maybe you can pass it. Okay. Maybe you can let it be. Because it'll okay. be, I, I would still say do a check, but I still think it will be an expensive proposition at this age. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then there's a following one from Somya, which I think is also a very interesting one. During emergency, which fund should we take out first? Oh, that's a very good one, right? So Somya, I would go after the logic which I gave you 20, 30, 50. I would also withdraw in that logic. I would take out from my savings account first because it's the lowest yielding and easy to quickly to access source. I would then look at my FD and then third, I would pull out from my liquid fund. I would, I would and as the, as the community leader, and I'm learning, um, you know, financial literacy every single day, um, one of my ways of deciding which which instrument I want to break is where I'm going to um, lose the least uh, money okay. and also um, depends on the liquidity of that instrument. Absolutely. One thing that I have learned is any instrument that's highly liquid has the least return. So it kind of goes correlated as well. If, if your investments are highly liquid, then they have the least return. You can make that decision accordingly, depending on your share, the distribution on that pie chart. Um, very, very good question, actually. It also made yeah. me think on how, you know, some certain things that just happen automatically in your brain over years of um, reading and self-learning. Um, great. We've got six minutes left and we've got a couple of things to share. I think um, before we even thank you, um, uh, Neha, I think you have something to I share with the community. More. I have well. some giveaway. I have more. Yeah. One last section, but I'm just touching on this because it is a section I cannot leave this room without talking about, which is budgeting, Simran. So I'm going to take everybody's five minutes, less than five minutes to go over this. Okay. And uh, I just want to talk about the fact that a lot of us in the room, please raise your hand if you are somebody who resists budgeting. Please don't feel shy. Like, yeah, I, I resist budgeting. I, I think it's a dirty word or it's a word which I, I don't like very much. Please go for it. Don't think that I'm going to judge you at all because I know a lot of us, me included when I was much younger, resisted budgeting. So I thought today we should just show you a something called as a smart budget. Okay. The first principle of budgeting is that um, it's something that you have to write. It feels very limiting. Absolutely, right? Absolutely the right word. I used to feel exactly this. And when I start budgeting, I, I get this anxiety and this sense that, oh, God, you know, um, what am I doing with my money, et cetera, et cetera. 
So I'm getting some answers. I try to. I like it now and stick to it. Yeah, but it actually gives you back control over your money uh, if you know how to do it in the right manner. So the first principle of creating a smart budget is to have it in writing. Okay, this is for those in the room who struggle with figuring out the answer to the question, "How much should I save?" That's a question I get a lot. How much should I save? How much should I save? So again, as a thumb rule, you can use the 50, 30, 20 principle again here. I've changed it a little bit. I've customized it to, you know, my style as usual. 50% on your needs, 20% on your wants and 30% on your savings. And this is mainly because I know that women can save more first. And second, because if you're someone who wants to build assets, create wealth for yourself, you've got to look at a minimum of 30, right? Starting with 20 will just keep you in the average range. If you want to do more, uh, start pushing yourself to have at least 30% savings. Some tips for those in the room who struggle with budgeting or struggle with managing their expenses, um, which I use now and helps me. Two bank accounts, one for spending, one for saving. Automate savings in the first month, week of the month. So if you have a consistent salary, for example, you can just set a system that from your spending account, the salary comes into your spending account. Shift it automatically within the first week into your saving account or the freedom fund or whatever bank account you want to name it as. And the third very important thing, which is a big one for me, is to categorize your expenses because this is where the wow happens. This is where you start identifying, hey, listen, I didn't realize having coffee with that friend who was not exactly great for my mental health was a good decision. Okay, so these are the moments when you start recognizing your patterns. And you can actually weed out some habits which you don't want to have and build a better money relationship. Um, I'm also giving out a budgeting tracker. Uh, we will be sharing the link in the following mail. I thought I'll give you all a... Do you all want a sneak peek? Do you all have time? Do you want to have a look at how this tracker looks? If we have like people saying yes, then I'm going to see it. If you all don't want to see it, also cool. No problems. You can always go and see. Three yeses doesn't do you it for see, me. Right? You, can see, women, you can see the... You can see the yes is a pouring. So yeah, yeah it's 50 it. women in yes. the room. I think at least, you know, there should be some like, yeah. And there should be like three, four S's, like some enthusiasm, no? Before we I end. I know, it. we've got 20 plus yeses. Yeah. So 50% of the audience is saying, yes, let's go for it. Let's go for it then. Okay. So the link that I'm sharing, it's actually part of a free resource uh, section on our website. And um, what we offer, thanks, I don't know. For the yeses. Okay, I got it. So um, what we offer is a, okay, it's an Excel. Okay, please don't get intimidated by an Excel, but it's fairly easy to understand and maintain. And uh, it's been categorized into um, your income. So you can just put your income sources. This is all editable. Okay, change the months here, change your income sources, change the total income amount. The total income will calculate itself. Then it's broken down into your needs and your wants, okay? Something which I personally used to struggle with a lot, like what's the need, what's the want? So what we've done is we've just built out these categories for you so that you can just start writing down what you've actually been doing, your wants, how much you've been spending. And finally, at the end, it throws up your savings and your saving rate. And that's the rate. Remember, I told you 30%. So as soon as you start going below 30% is the time when you can reflect back and say, hey, listen, this much, this month, zada shopping ho gaya. Yeah, maybe, you know, got to reduce those swiggy orders and stuff like that. Um, this helps you also look at the ideal. So on the right side, it has the ideal split for your income and what your current split looks like. So it also shows you whether which categories you need to prune down. So if your 50% is your need and I see 57% in my need, is there anything which I can do better here, right? Can I figure out a more optimum plan for my um, internet, et cetera, et cetera. Like lots of stuff for those, especially those who really struggle with budgets. This is important, helpful. My wants look really good. My savings look really healthy. So broadly, it's just one section and I can just, you know, maybe figure it out, do a little better and I'm good to go. So this is how it'll look um, for you. You can pull this down um, and use it, optimize it for yourself. I hope you liked it.
Yes, we will put the link in the chat as we have it and also share it as part of our newsletters, which obviously may, uh, would um, want um, uh, all of you to join our community if you haven't joined it, um, if you want this in our newsletter. Otherwise, um, go online, dig for it, go on the Women Insta platform. Um, yeah, we'll and find send you the link. Just go on the platform and download it. Yes, let's run through. We are actually on time, but let's just run through your conclusion and then wrap up the session. Yes, finally, just a few things, important things to sum up our financial security checklist. You're doing your monthly budgets. You have them in order. You have a clarity around your insurance policies. You know about the loans that you've taken or are there in your family. Again, a lot of women tend to not be very aware about the loans that they all have together. And finally, you have a glimpse about your investments, where the money is going. Once you have a sense of four of these, I think together it culminates into that feeling that we were talking about, that peace of mind that, yes, I think I'm feeling way more secure with my money. I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, we have a special offer of doing a one-on-one -on -one with the Womanista team. You can scan this, book yourself a free 15 minutes discovery call with me or Rachna, who's an expert uh, with Womanista as well. And finally, I have three interesting resources which I'm going to leave you with on this topic. If you like to read, I love, love, love this book called Your Money or Your Life by Vicky Robin. It was actually a revealing, a revelation for me um, and a lot of my budgeting style and tips and ideas were inspired by this book and um, I actually practiced it many years ago. Um, for listening, um, I also am a big fangirl of Monica Hallen. So she has this podcast on Spotify and you must listen to this podcast about why you should stop buying bundled life insurance, the stuff which I was just telling you, term versus non-term plans. And uh, for financial security, I actually have an entire video which was up on the Upgrad website. If you all want to access, I'm going to share that link as well. So you can go and watch it. Uh, it's called Becoming Financially Unbreakable. Um, so yeah, three resources which you all can use. You have the free 15 minutes to come in and chat with us. And that's it from me. And you have the budget template. So there's a lot of uh, kick-ass actions to take. Um, to get started on, um, you know, uh, taking your first steps, micro steps on building financial security and then your future wealth. With that, huge thank you, Neha. You're not going anywhere. We're going to be having you back um, for, for many more sessions in the future. Um, and please let us know if there are any specific topics you're interested in. We'll continue to curate them. And the, for the ones staying, thank you. We are a little over time. We'll take one more minute from you. Let's launch our final closing poll. Yes, here's the poll. So with that, while people are answering the poll, perhaps you can also um, do the wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Sundram. Neha, what a session. It was so packed. Thank you so much. And, and I'm sure each one of them would have uh, really, really enjoyed your session. And we could feel that from the uh, interactions and the questions and whatnot. Uh, so yes, thank you. Thank you so much for this lovely session. As always, you are so bubbly and energetic. Uh, thank you, audience. And, and we can't ask for a better uh, group, right? It, it was so lovely to have all of you on uh, evening. Thanks for sharing your time with us. And as uh, Sundran said, we have also put all the resources in the chat. Please do uh, use them. And uh, keep looking out on our, all our social media channels. We are coming up with real good sessions for all of you. And the next session is going to happen on the December 1st, 6 to 7 on the topic, Understanding Personal Finances by Pay Forward. So Anu Seth will be the facilitator who will be doing the session for us. So uh, do join us and spread the word. Uh, uh, you know, we have more exciting session for all our community members. Do join the community. You have the community link also put up in the chat window. 
So please uh, spread the word, share it to as many women as possible. Let's together make it happen. Thank you all once again for the wonderful evening. And thank you, Nega. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being such an engaging audience. Hope to see you all soon. Bye. Have a lovely evening. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.